you like to give your name, please? And Louise McCormick. And what year are you associated with? I came here in 1980 as a faculty member, but I was a student here in 1968 to 1972. And I know that you grew up in Plymouth. I'm a townie. And how was it that you decided to stay in town rather than go to Keene or Durham or, or out of state? Um, easy question. I just walked across the street to go to school. And I knew that Plymouth State had a, a very strong reputation in the field that I wanted to enter, which was physical education and I could probably save a lot of money if I walked across the street. Across the street. Yeah. Right. And, and you said you came in 1980 as a faculty person, and how many years did, were you at the college? 36 years. I retired in 2016. And in what way were you hired at the college? Where was I hired? How were you hired? Oh. Uh, what, were you hired in the PE department, or mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. it the PE department at that time, or it had changed its name? Or? I had been at Brooklyn College uh, five years before that. I was interesting story and a quick one. After my third year, I was home working during the summer, got a call unexpectedly and said, you're terminated. And I, I didn't understand. City of New York had gone bankrupt, and so they let everyone go that had not been there for seven years. I had been there for three. And so I came back home, uh, immediately got a job at St. Paul's for that semester. And then I went on to Merrimack High School, which was growing unbelievably because Anheuser-Busch had just moved in, so I was there for a couple of years. Then had a child and decided I needed to do more. So I called up the department and I said, if you ever need somebody to teach a course, please let me know. I can send you my credentials, etc." month later, I think it was in August before I started, they said, we have a full-time job. Would you like it? Oh, and it was a tenured position? Absolutely. Tenured position. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, that's kind of lucky to have that kind of thing happening to you. Mm -hmm. So what, what was your job title when you first came to the, to the college? Uh, was it just an instructor? Okay. Instructor, I believe, because I wouldn't have had my terminal degree. And so I earned that during my time, the next 10 years. Okay. And what kind of courses were you teaching while you were first here? Oh, I would say everything were new preparations for me, but it would have been in teacher education. So I would have had um, maybe one or two activity classes, but eventually I became the uh, coordinator for teacher education. So I was in charge of the teacher prep program for maybe 30 years. So I was in charge of anybody interested in teaching for physical education, health education, and then the combination that we designed. So I taught freshman classes, intro, method senior classes, two psychology classes. It was whatever they wanted me to teach, I did. You taught, that was great, yeah. And what did you think about the students when you first came here? I loved uh, them. I enjoyed them, they were a challenge. They were a challenge, but um, they accepted me and my level of expect, you know, I expected a great deal from them and um, they came up to my level. Now, you were probably the first one in your family to go to college. And oh, absolutely. And, and you were probably teaching kids that were the first ones in their family to also go to college. Um, that could be true. Yeah, my very first job at Brooklyn College, I was the same age as the students. I was 23 years old and I'm teaching 18 to 22 years old. That was a good experience and an interesting experience and I loved it. I loved it. So how did you see the change in students over the time that you were here in that 37 years? Uh, in terms of preparation, mm -hmm. and then having preparations for college? I, I have to be fair. I'm not sure a lot of our students today know exactly what they want to do for the rest of their life at 18 years of age. And I think we, as teachers and as advisees, have to understand that and do a little bit more probing when we have our advising sessions with them, get to know the students a great deal, um, even the last time I was, my last teaching classes at Plymouth, I mentioned it to my intro class, and I know a lot of them moved elsewhere throughout the campus, saying if you don't have the passion, now that you know what's expected of you, and I helped them move into other areas. Into other that measures they, that they mm -hmm. don't, don't want to own. Absolutely. So what was the difference in terms of, you know, you had essentially blue-collar kids when you first came, and then when you came, you know, later on and you and toward the end of your career, probably most of those kids have had parents that actually went to college themselves, so they weren't just 
necessarily the first generation. So well, how was that sort of different between the two sides? I have to be careful what I say. Uh, some of the students, I thought they had a great work ethic. And, and still today, I would say the same thing. The majority of my students had a strong work ethic, but I probably set the precedence for that if I could. This is what I expect. I'm a structured person. I expected them to be highly structured as well. They had to be organized to get through my class. I was throwing so many things at them. I think as the years went by, I was surprised during my last few years at Plymouth, there was an incident or two where parents came to the defense of the child. Uh, the um, helicopter child. Oh, of very thing. much so. Very much so. Um, very much so. That's all I can say. Mm, interesting, <laughs> interesting. So, uh, you know, you're here for a substantial period of time. How did you, what kind of changes did you see in the college over that time period? I in think terms of I, the way population wise, Larry, I even wrote the numbers down if I could. When I came here as a student, my first year here, there were 1,600 students. When I left Plymouth four years later, there were 2,200 students. When I came back in 1980, there were 2,700 students. So this was a massive growth in population happening here. Um, and along with the growth of the student body, you knew what was happening as far as the buildings are concerned. There was a period of time for 12 years that 11 buildings went up. Mm -hmm. And I watched this happen. When I was in high school, and the high school was still on or common, I would look over and I'd see the dining halls going up. It was pretty amazing time for, for those of us that were townies to watch the growth because the school was intermersed as far as uh, space together until the high school, elementary, and middle school moved out to um, Ward Road, Highland Street, Highland mm -hmm. Street. Now, having been in the big city, being at Brooklyn College, and mm -hmm. then coming back to a smaller school, mm -hmm. uh, so did you feel like you had made the right decision when you came back to Plymouth, or would you have been rather than that in the Big Apple? My world would have been different, you're right, if I stayed at Brooklyn College, if that could have been. I was at every museum or event you could think of during the weekends. I just, my mother had said to me, she was a New Yorker, New, New York City person, she said, take advantage, and I'm sure they were sweating every week, and I called them every week yeah, during that time. Mm -hmm. But then I think, knowing that we were, I was getting married, that we wanted to bring our children up here because we had such a wonderful upbringing, and we wanted the same for our children. So I didn't hesitate to come back. It was a blessing, absolutely mm -hmm. a blessing. Yeah. And, and you never felt over the 37 years that mm, maybe I should have stayed down in New York? Never. Isn't yeah. that interesting? Never. I loved it. So uh, when you were at Plymouth as a student, I mean, this is a little bit different because most people just come as a faculty person. Mm -hmm. Was there any particular person that you influenced you as a student? I think I was very lucky. Um, my department had a large number of men and women involved. They were teaching, they were coaching, they were advising. And even as I transferred from a student to a colleague, I remember the guidance that Dayton Spaulding shared with me. Dayton was a PE person who moved into health education for his doctorate, I believe. Uh, Janet Nell. Janet coached every season. She taught everything there was during that time. She was kind. Um, and I remember, it's a short story, she stopped us as juniors or seniors one day. We had just finished an outdoor class, maybe it was a lacrosse class, and she brought the women together. We were separated by gender at that time. And she said, ladies, is there anything else you need before you go out and student teach? And boy, that stayed with me forever. It told me that she cared enough about what our needs were. And she said, we're gonna make it happen. We gave suggestions, she incorporated it, and I've never forgotten that. It's mm -hmm. important that we ask the students what they need. Mm -hmm. And, and the third one, I can't forget, Dot Deal. As a leader on the field and off the field, I found her as the other two, they were professionals. Their work ethic was amazing. I was very lucky. I think I missed two times in my 36 years at Plymouth, sickness-wise, sickness-wise. Mm -hmm. And the same with my colleagues. They were always there, no matter what happened. Dot Deal said to me, you got to get sick when you can afford to get sick, which meant during the summertime. Right, right, mm -hmm. not during the regular academic yeah. year. <laughs> so, so uh, what kind of changes, you know, that you think is pretty
pretty major changes over the time period that you've been here from you know the 1980s through now <coughs> as to how the college has changed and, mm -hmm. and whether that change has been good or bad maybe even I think each president each administration that comes in moves in has their own personality and um, I don't know if it's dictated to them or not what changes should take place but we had so few majors when I was here as a student, and when I came here in 80, from 80 the next 36 years, the number of majors that evolved, evolved over time, and I think people really could, um, they knew what was coming. For example, if you instituted physical therapy, we, or anything in the area of healthcare, it's because there was a need. They could project what the needs would be over the next decade or two. That's. Um, that's a good thing. That's mm -hmm. a good thing. Were there any, you know, any, any of those particular people that were president or dean or provost that sort of stamped out in your mind as having given more leadership to the college than maybe some of the other people might have? Well, I've done a little history here at Plymouth in regard to the presidents. I can't imagine being a president in the early part of the um, 20th century. I remember the talk about Dr. Hyde coming here in the 50s. And there was some growth happening there, and there was the question of whether or not Plymouth State University, oh, I'm sorry, you have to go backwards. Plymouth, yeah. Plymouth Teachers College was going to remain as um, a college, or was it going to become part of the university system of New Hampshire? And he was here for decades. He was here for almost 30 years, I believe. Uh, I think of the personality that um, Sarah Jane Steen had when she came here. She became involved with both the town and the university. She understood there was a need. She was visible, she was out there. And I always seem to think that she truly cared. Don Warden brought us through Plymouth State College to a university. So they, each one of them did something different. Uh, Sarah Jane, I think, was the impetus behind the Museum of the White Mountains. Uh, and so each president had their own, as, again, personality, but had something that they wanted to accomplish during the time mm -hmm. they were here. So how have you seen the college in terms of uh, its relationship to the state during that time period? You know, are we, do we have more outreach today than maybe when you were first a student or maybe when you first came back as a faculty member? The marketing mm -hmm. says that we have more outreach. The more I read about this institution, read on paper, TV, um, ads, come to Plymouth, we have a diversified population or as best as we could have it. Um, so, and of course, being here for such a long period of time, what do you think some of your contributions that you made both to the department and maybe to the, to the college or, or to even to the community as a member of the college faculty? I hope my students, and that's my concern always, I hope my students would say I was an effective teacher. I, I, I know I'm structured. I expect a great, I expected, past tense, a great deal from my students, and they rose to the occasion. That was my job all the time. I gave up many opportunities outside the state because they were going to take me away from my students, and students wanted me to be there. They had a need many of them. They needed the guidance, they needed my presence, etc. Um, I, I was the, in charge of a club for years, and I know this sounds really um, boasting. During those years, I've said this before, I tried to calculate at one time, I probably had more than a thousand students go to conferences with me. Mm. That's easy. State, regional, and national. That's what I thought they should do, so I would organize so they could get to Maryland with me or wherever mm. the event was going on. Eventually, that turned into presenting with me. So I've had hundreds of students present mm -hmm. with me. That's part of their resume, and I explained to them from day one, you may not thank us now because we required them to do certain professional experiences, but when you're done at Plymouth, that resume will be chopped full, and you'll be ready to get a job. And I always wanted them to say, job of choice. You are that good coming from this institution in this field you should be able to get a job of choice. Not any old job, the one that's going to excite you, challenge you, and I'm still challenged today, so. Right. And what about your contributions, let's say, to the department and to the college as a whole? How much were you involved in yeah. terms of departmental business or 
college uh, business. Yeah, I um, I don't know what we called ourselves, but at one time we had a chair and two assistants. So I was an assistant and I did anything we could. Uh, when they asked me to look at the history of athletics and all our awards and honors, I put something like that together. I put together the history of my department, who came when. It was important for me, really important. And all the, those experiences helped me know that I was going to do something like this in the future. And what I do now is pretty much historically based. Where, you know, the town itself, the college, athletics, where those kinds of projects I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. And why don't you talk a little bit about your work uh, with DNM? Because oh. having been a person in town and know what DNM mm -hmm. did in town, and then becoming a faculty member, yeah. uh, what, did you. You, what, what was your you know, the contributions did you make that way? I, after so many years, I thought it was logical working in the Draper and Maynard building and that was the largest employer we've ever had in this town. Making, they were credited with making the first padded baseball glove for those people that may not be aware. I decided to start putting information together. And someone said, why did you end up with a book? I started to write an article, I ended up with a book. And I said, probably because I was born in the Draper house. Mr. Maynard lived across the street. Upon my father's death, I found out that my father was going to be an artist. He did a lot of artwork for years and, and folded up. He had done some work that was still oh, for there. Draper mm -hmm. and right. Maynard, he worked for them. Mm -hmm. They went to Boston, and Dad would do the artwork, and someone else would cut out the leather material, and by the end of the day, this is at Jordan Marsh, oh, they would yeah. have a vest made for you. Oh, okay. Interesting wow. there. And I worked in that building for how long? 15. How could I not be interested mm -hmm. in that subject matter? Every month, still, I get someone, I just finished one last week, they still email me, saw my name somehow associated with Draper and Maynard, and would like to know the history, the background of a glove, or a baseball, mm -hmm. or whatever. So it's given me a great deal of pleasure, and I've met some wonderful people That's along the way. Right. I've been very lucky, right. very lucky. And of course, having been a townie, but also being a faculty member, what kind of changes do you see, what kind, what kind of effect on the town of Plymouth did you see the college having over this time period? Um, I'm gonna change that a little bit. I'm a believer that compromise is really important. And I know, maybe you know this as well, but in the mid 70s, there were opportunities where, I think it was one of our deans, I'm pretty sure, would have barbecues. Plymouth was growing so fast and more of our students were going to live outside of the boundaries of our campus, and someone suggested let's have some family barbecues so that the family could meet the, and from that they started the CCC um, group, and I think they still, it's where you have members of the university and members of the town get together, still today in 2019, talk about the issues and try to work them out. Mm -hmm. That for me is really important. I've written on that nationally. We're an unusual town. I do something in a couple months for a literary group in the name of Plymouth, New Hampshire, a most unusual town. Rarely do you get a small community like we have and you have an ever-growing university. It brings its challenges, but you have to be really ready to compromise and ask yourself what is best for both entities that we have. Um, and maybe that's why I started touring. Our students really didn't know our town. During the last five years I was at Plymouth, don't tell anybody because I might get in trouble from one of the presidents, I would take my students, my seniors first, and then my first years because they heard about it, I would do their review for their exam on a tour. So I would have 10 or 12 sites. I would go to the site, for example, the Plymouth Historical Society, and I would give them a couple minute speech on what you see across the street or what we, then I would give them a couple questions that might be on their final. And the students agreed with me as seniors, they did not know this town. And that's why, and it didn't come to fruition, unfortunately, I thought I'd written a book on the town, I'd written on, with a number of people, Marsha Blaine and I did one on the university, why shouldn't we have a class called Our Town? And it was, it um, didn't go through, and yet I feel that would have been a major contribution. Mm -hmm. Any Gen N folks coming in to know our town during their four or five years here, 
And some of the kids, one story, the boy said to me, Dr. McCormick, I did what you said. I spent my summer here at Plymouth. All right, that was fine. We met on the street one day. And he said, I don't think I want to go back home. <laughs> you are right. This town is an amazing town, and the people are really wonderful. And you don't get to know them unless you become part of them. And we're still separated, in my opinion. I'm not trying to be mean. Right. We, we don't intermingle enough. The students themselves... And it was my way, my head said, if they knew about the town, as well as the campus, as well as the campus, don't get me wrong, they would respect it more and we wouldn't see um, the few issues that do arise occasionally. So it must have been kind of a, a little bit of a shock to you having gone to the intermediate school here on campus <laughs> and then having, realizing that 30 years later that the intermediate school was part of the, I guess, social science, geography <laughs> department. Mm-hmm. 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 Changes have occurred everywhere on this campus. They have. I'm, I'm questioning when do we stop the po- population growth so that the town can handle it and the university can handle it. Because some people came here because of its smallness, because the population was small enough that mom and dad th- thought their child would receive the attention that they deserve. Um, I think... I hope it's happened that way. I think most of us, you and I as instructors, probably felt that uh, we spent time outside of our classes with our students, and that's what they wanted. I can be an effective teacher, but you won't get to know me unless you see me before class or after class or you become part of a club or an experience Mm -hmm. with me. Uh, So you weren't sort of the kind of faculty that came just for class time and office hours? Oh, I don't think so, Larry. Um, We had meetings early on at 7 in the morning, and during the 15 years that my children and husband and I lived in Keene, I lived in that D&M building, and I slept in that D&M building. I don't think so. I was there. The kids, until five to six, I don't know, five or six years before I retired, I told the kids they could email me or call me anytime they wanted, and then I stopped it. I stopped it. I said, you cannot email me after 10 o'clock at night. I do not want to respond. <laughs> you won't respond, right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, having been there for a while, is, are there any lessons, sort of take-home lessons that you might give to future faculty members uh, about uh, having a career at Plymouth? I loved it. It, what it, um, you have to decide how much you want to give back to both the town and the university. A student made a comment to me, and I wrote it down. She said, you believed in me before I believed in myself. Mm. And I thought, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. So I still have every letter, card, emails, Hallmark cards, emails that came across since I was here. And someday I'll take them all out, and I will read them. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. I will do a good cry along with that too. <laughs> but it's the kids that they do that. It's unsolicited. They want, just want to tell you. One boy, one night, I'm at, it's pretty late. I'm in DM. And he said, I'm connecting with you. And I wanted to let you know, as I told you, I decided not to go into teaching. I went into finances and he's making, a ve- he's had a very good life. But he said, everything I did in the business that I am in today, I learned through your program. So it, content is one thing. But when we reach out and we talk about life, they don't forget those life lessons. Sort of the personal care that you gave to them. Mm -hmm. And also expectations. It goes back. If you believe in yourself or you believe in your students, then they will rise to that occasion. Most of them will, yeah. So we're nearing sort of the end of 30 minutes. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you Mm -hmm. might want to talk about? Uh, Something that maybe has happened uh, at Plymouth during the time that you were here that sort of was seminal in terms of your your time at Plymouth? I was challenged during my times at Plymouth. There were times because I was brought in when I had a brand new son. Those years were tough. Somebody said, what were your first years like? I was teaching, I was coaching, and I had an eight-month-old child, and nobody knew what to do with me because I was the first to come in here. Those have changed over time. So I think the women will have... um, They're in a better position. More support. Very much so. Very much. It was not there in the beginning, and that is not blaming anybody at all. They didn't know what to do with a person like me. Um, And I struggled through them, and I put them off to the side. And I have to say, 
during the 36 years, and even now, boy, I miss teaching. I really miss teaching. But I do it in a different way. Whatever I did years ago with students who were college age, I'm now doing it with older folks in another capacity with a historical society. So I keep going and I keep learning, and I'm enjoying the people that I'm working with, and that's so, so important. Well, thank you so much for being willing to be interviewed <laughs> for this uh, mm -hmm. 150th anniversary, and we wish you well in the next uh, decades or so of your commitment to We'll the talk family. again when we're both 100. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to show my B.